Welcome to the Cast. It is episode 95 for the week of November 7th. If you're listening to this, the drop bombs haven't started dropping yet. I'm joined today by my good friends and colleagues, Rose Bihar. Hi, happy to be here. Are you happy to be here? I mean, I'm, I'm happy to be in this safe space. That's good. Let's just say that. You have a little cubicle. <laughs> Rose is actually sitting in a cardboard box right now. Yeah, I do have a, a full astronaut helmet on <laughs> well, that I've constructed we both, out of cardboard. We, the viewers, and I do mean viewers, will know that's a lie because ah, this is the first time it, yes. we're doing a right. video podcast. So for all one of you that was demanding for a video podcast, there you go. Been bamboozled. That's also the voice of Zach Gilbert. Zach, how are you? Great yourself. That's also the voice of Zach Gilbert. Right. Just a different voice. In a world. And you would know that because you're watching the video podcast. Yeah. Hey, how's it going? <laughs> and last but certainly not least, <laughs> one Patrick O'Rourke. How are you, sir? I'm good. What's up? Not too much. Let's jump into the music and then we'll get right into the topics. So... Unless you were living under a rock this week, you of course know that I was referring when I said bombs dropping that one Donald Trump got elected the president of the United States. And although we are, you know, a Canadian podcast talking about Canadian telecom and tech, um, we do live in the sphere of the United States and the uh, U.S. tech world. And uh, I mean, obviously, everyone was taken aback um, unless you were a diehard Trump supporter, then you were obviously very happy about the result. Probably uh, still taken aback. Still taken aback. I mean, even Peter Fail was like, oh my goodness, this worked out it for happened. me. Should yeah. we like preface this with uh, the discussion here on it does not review the flex reflects of mobile syrup or anything? Sure. Yes, does not reflect the view of mobile syrup. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> These are exactly. our personal <laughs> views. Yes, of no, course. No, but true. Absolutely. And, and we are just all individuals. And also to say that, you know, if, if you are a Trump supporter, um, don't feel that this is any sort of attack. These are just our views. You're welcome to have your own opinion. Um, but that's more than okay. Yeah. So anyway, um, more so like, you know, there's so much to unpack with a Trump pres presidency. Excuse me. I've had trouble with that word this whole morning. <laughs> um, but really what I wanted to talk about was just kind of the effect on tech because, you know, um, much of the tech world, with the exception of one Peter Thale, of course, had put their uh, eggs into the Hillary Clinton basket. Um, and they're taken aback, specifically, um, among others, Tim Cook, uh, Rose, you wrote about the letter that he sent to Apple employees, and it's a very fascinating letter, um, especially, you know, if you read it backwards, it's really interesting right. reading it backwards, right? Um, so can you tell us about that letter? So it's interesting that you say that because probably he started with the content at the bottom and yeah. then felt that he had to make it uh, a little more... Uh, double-sided but essentially what he said was that he reaffirmed apple's commitment to kind of progressive ideals and to diversity and to like the safety and support of all of their um all of their employees a and then at the top of the letter he did say that it was important that people had to move forward together that this was an incredibly divisive campaign or election in which uh, the two candidates got, you know, it was a very, very close race. So of course there'd be a lot of, uh, a, a lot of emotion like bubbling over in the workplace. And I'm sure that that's been an issue in Apple and every other workplace in the States. Um, probably a lot of heated debates following the election. Mm -hmm. um, so he was kind of underlying the importance of, uh, let's try and understand each other and, and go forward together. Yeah, another tech CEO who had uh, less than kind things to say about Trump leading to his election, but has subsequently, you know, congratulated him is our favorite boy, Jeff Bezos. Uh, he joked at one point about putting Donald Trump into a rocket and sending him to space. Um, after which Donald Trump said, you know, one of his first targets should he become president would be to launch a antitrust and legal investigation into uh, the Washington Post and uh, the newspaper, which Jeff Bezos owns and Amazon. Um, he's since congratulated him. Um, and you, right. can, you kind of see this like in tech, right? Like tech was, uh, like I said, aside from Peter Thiel was so aligned against him. And right. now 
So, but what I've and won- in Apple in specific because mm. Apple refused to fund in any way the Republican in convention. convention. Yeah, it, when other big all, all the other such big as Microsoft, t- yeah, yes, yeah, Google, they did. So, so the question I wanted to pose uh, to the panel here, and I think we'll start with Zach. Um, <clears throat> you know, everything aside, you know, there's already been so much talk about like how will Donald Trump affect his presidency, affect you know climate change, how will it affect civil rights. But how do you think, as Canadians living in Canada, how will it affect the tech that comes to uh, to Canada? Like, do you see, you know, what will, um, with so much of our tech coming from Silicon Valley, California, you know, what effect will that have on tech? Well, the hard thing is, is that um, he's gone on record saying he doesn't agree with uh, NAFTA, North American Free Trade Agreement, um, and that he will just pull the U.S. out of it if the other so Canada and Mexico don't agree to the new terms of this agreement yeah. so if I can just interrupt you for one second I saw a splendid tweet which I shared with you guys <laughs> I was uh, just thinking of that uh, you know when uh, Donald Trump won obviously uh, Pierre Trudeau or excuse me not Pierre Justin yeah. Trudeau the younger <laughs> uh, he congratulated him and there was an amazing response where it was this teenager I assume she was like don't let him tear up NAFTA dad <laughs> <laughs> that was a good tweet. I enjoyed it. Nine out of ten. But continue, sir. So yeah, so the the f- you know North American free trade agreement is huge. Um, supposed to allow for better trade within North America, obviously, right? Mm-hmm. Um, reduce duties, taxes, whatever, levies, and whatnot. Tariffs. Um, tariffs, and yeah, exactly. So, with his idea of bringing manufacturing into America to make America great again, <laughs> and if we haven't affected or changed or lesser in favor for Canada or Mexico, uh, NAFTA agreement, then that could huge, you know, have huge adverse effects on cost of our products we get. Um, or even the ability for the companies to, in the American companies to want to ship stuff to us. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's, that's, that's how I think the biggest way is going to, you know, it's going to impact tech. So I have a separate question for you, Pat, but go ahead. The iPhone's going to cl- cost a lot of money when it's manufactured in the United States. Oh, yeah. Because right. that's what he wants, right? That, that oh, he goodness. called Apple out specifically. So, I'm, so I will speak to this, uh, this point specifically. Uh, when the iPhone, when um, Foxconn first started manufacturing the iPhone 6, it had approximately uh, 110,000 people on its assembly line. Uh, when it started manufacturing the success, so just a year later, there were 60,000 people on its manufacturing line. Um, Foxconn specifically and other companies in Shenzhen and other parts of China where these kind of manufacturing hubs, they've invested all of their like revenue towards uh, automating their assembly yep. lines, right? Like it's not only that these jobs don't exist in America anymore, it's that they're disappearing from the entire world, <laughs> right? Like Absolutely, yeah. Um, and so I think, you know, it just underscores the point, like in Canada, we have to invest in these like amazing infra- infinite internet infrastructure, excuse me, um, making it a utility, um, making it so that, um, you know, these people who have lost their jobs from the manufacturing sector can go back to school and, you know, learn new skills that are applicable in the digital world. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Those are so important digital skills right now. And mm-hmm. And the funny thing, too, is, uh, I mean, not just Donald Trump, also Hillary Clinton, like both candidates knew so little about technology, oh, gee, yeah. although I would say absolutely Donald Trump more. Uh, he so. just refers to technology in general as the cyber. But he's but he's such a Twitter maven. Yeah, he knows how to use he, Twitter. He's all though. up on the Twitters. Yeah. Hey, I, it's probably the only thing he knows. At least in Canada, Justin Trudeau, Snapchat. Mm-hmm. He's yeah, on just Snapchat. to kind of throw that in there. He just had Snapchat last week. I mean, Donald Trump actually uh, advocated for uh, the military moving to um, paper letters for their communications yeah. rather than, you know, anything digital. I heard he was going to go message in a bottle. Right. Yeah. 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 Messenger that's pigeons. That'd yeah. be good. So, I mean, I think that I, I have no question in my mind as to why. I mean, there's a lot of reasons that California currently is feeling like it wants to secede from the rest of the U.S., but mm-hmm. I think more than ever, it's just such a different world. And I, f- and I think a lot of that is that, like, their industry uh, is not really understood by the government, mm-hmm. and they feel stifled so, by it. Uh, you know, Patrick, we spoke about this on the CanCon podcast earlier uh, this morning, but do you see a kind of situation in which some of these tech companies, perhaps, or their at least their workforce 
starts migrating to Canada, you know? I, I think you're going to see some of that, but maybe not as much as some mm-hmm. people would like to think there will be. Like, it's it's one thing to go on Facebook and be like, oh, Trump won. Now I'm going to leave. I'm going to move to Canada. But it's another thing to actually go through the process, like the, the mm-hmm. immigration process yeah. of, of doing Absolutely. that. Um, so for some people, I think that's a lot of talk. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I do think that it, it makes working for a large tech company in Canada may be a little more attractive for mm-hmm. certain employees. But you could do it so easily, just download the syrup. What is that app? That we were oh, on? Yeah. Maple Match. Maple, Maple Match. Match. You know, just download Maple, Ma- Maple Match. I can't speak. <laughs> oh, my gosh. You um, sound like the spokesperson yeah. for Maple Match. <laughs> this is Marple Marsh. <laughs> um. <laughs> so, uh, Rose, um, not to give too much information about your personal life, but your boyfriend yeah. is, you know, He's Canadian and American, yeah. works for Microsoft. Um, I was just going to mention that. Do you want to kind of speak to how he and his colleagues have been feeling? Definitely. So at the time, um, and this is a really huge issue when it comes to Silicon Valley and Trump, um, Mike it works at Microsoft and most of his team are immigrants. They're not citizens mm-hmm. yet. So they were not able to vote. And when they were watching the results, many of them felt very, very uh, afraid that they would be deported uh, once Trump gets into office. And we'll have to see how serious his threats have been regarding immigration. Um, but it is, uh, it, it is very nerve wracking. And they've also, he's also threatened to do away with the H-1B, uh, B-1, I think, visa, mm-hmm. uh, which would be really, really bad uh, for the industry. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that alone, a lot of uh, tech leaders have said, you know, Trump doesn't know what he's doing. We're going to lose a lot of great talent that we can't find here. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, I mean, a country like more so than its natural resources, it's kind of future really lies in its people. Right. And I think uh, I said this uh, on the CanCon podcast, but like crisis is another word for opportunity. Right. And this is a, an amazing opportunity for Canada. It it, is, you yeah. know. Um, Douglas on that podcast spoke about Canada being one of the last liberal democracies, at least from the perspective of the world that's left in the world, right? Yeah. Like that bastion is gone in the UK, um, seemingly on its way out in the US, right? And so um, if if we have great leadership in this country where we continue to be a welcoming country, then I think Canada will reap the benefits. I right? actually saw a pretty serious campaign happening on Facebook where Mike, my partner who works at Microsoft and his uh, his fellow co-workers were saying, we want to go start an office, a bigger office in uh, Canada wow. for mm-hmm. Microsoft. Microsoft North. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I will say like Hillary Clinton said, you know, uh, she didn't say these words, but you have to give people the benefit of the doubt and I'm not sure Donald Trump has necessarily earned it, but you still need to give them that benefit of the doubt. Let him first govern. I mean, just the his first meeting with Obama was so strange, right? In the sense that he was this brash man who suddenly had so little to say, right? And yep. seemed at loss that he had actually been elected. And now, like, you know, if you've read about Obama's work ethic, he'll stay up until like 3, yep. 3 th- or like 30 in the morning wake up at seven and he's constantly reading, constantly trying to get educated on the topics that he has to make decisions on. And here you have this man who one doesn't like to, or is kind of revels in his own ignorance. Yep. Right? He was ill prepared for every debate. I mean, yeah. I think that's fair to say he didn't have answers to many questions. His mm-hmm. platform was not really fleshed out and he didn't hire policymakers until sort of the last minute. Mm-hmm. So we have to remember he was busy building his empire. <laughs> That's okay. true. Yes, this is the host of The Apprentice that we're talking about. Yeah, yeah. reality TV coming to an American, well, it's already there, but American White House reality TV show coming soon. The, new, sure. the next season of The United States. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, sorry, you wanted I was, to say I something I was going to say, um, so one of our, our tech leaders here in Canada, John Chen, mm-hmm. actually didn't support uh, Donald Trump and was vocal about that, even though he had been a Republican advisor for uh, George W. Bush. Do you know what his specific role was in the Bush administration? I believe it was um, tech related. Okay, yeah. wow. So, I mean, it, 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 but now he spoke to somebody at Bloomberg TV just saying, well, you know, it's happened. We have to make the best of it. 
Yeah. Well, so what's interesting, you bring up BlackBerry and something that uh, former BlackBerry CEO, co-CEO, <laughs> as Zach is <laughs> want to remind me, um, Jim Balsilli, he, you know, I remember reading this editorial where he was talking about how in Silicon, or sorry, in the White House, you know, under the Obama administration, very savvy you know, tech person, um, the main Silicon Valley leaders were there almost day, whether it was Larry Page, you know, Sergey, uh, Tim Cook. They were always there helping uh, Obama in, inform his uh, administration on tech, right? Right. Um, and now suddenly with Trump, you know, because he, you know, I don't want to insult your candidate or your president, but he has this vindictive streak, right? And yes. suddenly he's going to get all his information from Peter Thale, who's just one person, right? Like, Right. So that's interesting. Yeah. Right. And so Peter like, Thale is now advisor. Yeah. Right. Um, and so, again, that's an opportunity for Canada where, you know, maybe you're Justin Trudeau. You extend this olive branch to all these tech leaders and be like, hey, like, we'll inform our Paul and even not just American tech leaders, but obviously Canadian ones as well. Be like, hey, well, like, I will always have an open ear. Right. Yeah. Like, yeah, that would give you sort of uh, that's an important edge to have as a modern day country. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know. Should catastrophic climate change happen, untold wars, at least you'll be able to escape to virtual reality. Uh, so <laughs> uh, the one thing that did happen in tech this week is that the release of Daydream View, our one Patrick O'Rourke, uh, future career as VR model. That's what I'm going to do. With this beautiful <laughs> chiseled jaw and That's what I'm amazing do. Just, hair. Just walk around with VR headsets on and have people take pictures of me. Yeah. I'd like to note too that the, the day after the election, Patrick was in VR pretty much the yeah. entire day. I just, I just wore the headset <laughs> for most of the day working on the review. Um, so yeah, Day Daydream came out. Um, so what is Daydream View? Please tell us. Daydream View is an evolution of cardboard. Google's project, uh, VR project, where it was literally a piece of cardboard. Um, and this is, this is an extension of what they started with that. This isn't, uh, I think you talked about it in CanCon, it's not their like 15% project. This is like mm -hmm. Google taking VR seriously, trying to find a way to make virtual reality appeal to the average person. So beyond like people that just play video games. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess in my review, I think it's a great start. The biggest issue with it is the fact that it only works with the Pixel and the Pixel XL right now. Mm -hmm which makes it about on par with the Gear VR, the previous attempt by Samsung, uh, which I would say was pretty successful. It's like a, it's a decent device, uh, but it's held back by the fact that it only works with um, newer Samsung devices. So the S7, the S7 Edge, uh, the dearly departed Note 7, I, I believe mm -hmm. it worked with as well, uh, and the S6 as well. Um, well, they just, you know, going into the release of the Note 7, they released a new iteration yeah, of they the did, Gear yeah. VR that was specifically designed to work with the Note. Right. And oh, then, yeah. Yeah. Um, so Samsung's still committed to that. They're still doing their own thing. Um, I don't know if that's smart with, with Daydream. It's the obvious future of that type of VR. Um, but the problem is, is that no devices other than the Pixel and Pixel use this, right? So Google's vision is almost dead on arrival just because there's no devices yet. Six months, that'll be different. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a totally different story. There's probably going to be like a Samsung phone uh, that uses it. There'll be an LG phone. Right. All the manufacturers will have a device. But right now... It's very difficult to recommend um, simply because of that and also because there's not very much software available for it. Mm. That's going to change, I think. Um, can't know for sure, but I think it's going to change uh, because Google's created this unified platform where there's specific hardware requirements that manufacturers have to meet, so developers have a unified platform to develop on. And it was interesting because we had noted that um, initially, the ZT Axon 7, and I think the Asus Zenfone yeah. Deluxe 3 said they were going to be daydream ready. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was even in like their press materials. Right. But then you like go on their websites now and there's, there's no mention of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and Google hasn't said anything about it. So I think perhaps what Google wants to do is like come out with an announcement where they talk about, I don't know, maybe like 10 different phones that are going to support it. Right. And maybe there'll be software updates for the Axon 7. Um, cause that would be a great, uh, what, what's the axon? Like it's under $500, isn't it? It's a, just, I think at the $500, $500? level. In and it's, it's a decent phone for the most part, right? It's like an 21 right? Yeah. yeah. No, it is. Yeah. I know it you is. had like some issues with it, but for that price point, Fairly minor, it's yeah. decent, right? Yeah. So that makes like you buy that, you buy the headset. That's like 600 bucks, still a ton of money. But if you're going to buy a phone anyways, and this headset's available and it works with the phone that you're buying, mm -hmm. like it makes VR more accessible than buying like a $2,000 or 
um, computer and then like a thousand two hundred dollar HTC Vive. So on that note, Patrick, um, <clears throat> your girlfriend's brother comes up to you and he says, "Quote, Patrick, I want the dankest VR headset this Christmas. <laughs> Which one do I get?" I would tell him to buy a PlayStation VR. Okay. Okay. Oh, wow. Because um, for he likes games. Mm-hmm. I he, he's he's the dank memer that likes games. So mm-hmm. I would tell him to get PlayStation VR here to a PlayStation. It's mm-hmm. 500 bucks. You get, I, I, I struggle with calling PlayStation VR high-end VR because um, it is, but it isn't. It's obviously not as impressive as Oculus with touch or the Vive with its room scale stuff, but it's like leaps and bounds ahead of Daydream and Cardboard and Gear VR. It's like on another level. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that for most people, uh, PlayStation VR, oh, well, not most people, people that play games, that's like the one that you want. Because I think the best games are going to come to to PlayStation VR. Yeah, I th- you know, like with so much with tech, it's not about being the best, it's being good enough. Yeah. And PlayStation VR, that's it's true. that sweet spot, right? It is good enough. So yeah, and, and Sony has like expertise with working with developers to make games, as like you and I know. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think the best software is going to come to PlayStation VR, despite the fact that it's not as powerful as the other devices. There's a fundamental issue, though. So, yeah, you could have a great console, great games, great VR. But I don't know if you guys want to chime in, but the price, right? Like, there's Mm. no way we're going to get VR to be at that mass adoption rate with the prices worth it. Even $99, uh, was it $99, right, for the uh, Gear VR? Or not the Gear VR, sorry, the Daydream. Um, Just bundle it in. Like it know. does come with a bag of Cool Ranch Doritos mm, cool ranch <laughs> and double <laughs> XP in the in the new Call of Duty, and I can uh, make some s- what, spells with uh, Fantastic Beasts. Right. That game's not even out yet. Mm, wah, wah, wah. That part. sucks. But no, like you know, they Google did do it with some of the pre-orders, right? Where you get the Daydream included, which people are like, Google WTF? Where's my code to get this Daydream? Because people yeah. can just go buy it, and nobody's getting the code to get it yet. Right. Um, but. It's such a niche. There's so many options, so many different platforms for VR, but it's such a niche market because of this price point. <clears throat> $99 for most is like, that's eh, not too much money. You know, it's like decent Christmas yeah. gifts or whatever, yeah. right? But it's still like, it's not going to get for that segment of VR, it's not going to get it to mass adoption. Right. And I mean, it doesn't really have enough functionality to be worth $99. They're, they're trying. I mean, there's like a specific YouTube uh, 360 app now that's yeah. actually pretty cool. I would say that it's the most interesting app available on Daydream. And that's a, like that's an issue to me. Like, would, you know, one mm-hmm. app and, and it's YouTube is the like the pinnacle of this this platform, right? Well, that's the other thing. It's like a broader conversation about VR. Like, what is the average person going to use it for, right? Beyond beyond gaming, what what are its purposes? So there's there's other cool stuff that's in there. Um, there's like a Google Arts and Culture app where you can explore like museums, and there's like a Street View uh, thing where you can um, visit uh, famous places and landmarks. Like those are the things that they're trying to implement to give the average person who doesn't care about games a reason to to put on this headset. Um, but I mean, so ninety nine dollars is a lot of money, but for also for, for for what you're getting. But also, um, dude, I feel it's like, like track pants on your face. Don't say <laughs> that. yeah, yeah. It's like I might as well yeah. I'd say track pants are like a freaking um, was a sock on your face or, or you know. I whatever. feel I feel like compare especially compared to the other headsets. That's like a, a sweet uh, sweet spot for mm-hmm. for price point. hundred bucks uh, for someone who's like casually interested in trying out VR. I think that's cool. That's fine a reasonable price the problem right now is the phones like this needs to be able to work with more than just the over thousand dollar pixel xl and the like nine hundred dollar pixel it's a yeah, true cart before cart before the horse right yeah. and and it questions you what their like their plan and their their total you know organization behind this and what they're thinking of doing well i mean i think you when you're developing new technology like this it's always going to be a little out of reach of the normal uh, consumer at first like take the first mobile phone ever in 1984 it was three thousand nine hundred and ninety five dollars yeah, yeah. Like that. but and it made <laughs> phone calls goes. what is, you know yeah. what sets this apart other than like the touch controls from a cardboard so the what to me what sets it apart is the potential uh cardboard the biggest problem was disparate devices with different um hardware using a device uh, and making vr experiences that weren't stable so like lag uh, games crashing, phones overheating. The idea behind Daydream is that Google has these requirements that your phone has to hit in, o- in order to be Daydream certified. 
eventually there's going to be headsets from other manufacturers. Right. So to speak to your $99 point, maybe like, I don't know, uh, one touch is going to come out with, um, one, uh, what's it called? One plus one plus three. What's the company actually called? One, one plus, plus one plus, plus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> brain brains broken today. Um, maybe they'll come out with a daydream headset. That's like a little cheaper. Right. Um, I think that's key to it. But the big thing with Daydream is that it's this platform that's unified. It gives developers a place to release apps on uh, specific hardware specifications. That's what changes it. So potential. The potential is there. That's what's different. Cardboard could only go so far. This is the next step. There's a ton of potential. Uh, what needs to happen is developers need to take advantage of that potential. Whether or not they do or not, I don't know. All right, so I ask you guys also one question. You got a hundred bucks. Sorry, hundred and thirteen dollars with tax. What are you gonna do? Buy the VR? Or are you gonna do something else? Pat or Rose? Whoever's first. I'm going to I'm going to buy one hundred dollars worth of Cool Ranch Doritos. Yes. That is a one. No, I think I, I actually would I would buy the Daydream View. Really? Yeah. I think hundred bucks is like a great price or something like that. Yeah, but how, I could like how, much, how cheap do you expect it to be? Like twenty five dollars? Like I gotta get that's a, cardboard. I could right? get a one year membership to Canvas One Eleven. No, um, <laughs> and are you a shill for Canvas yeah, yeah. One Eleven? Um, no, you know, fifty bucks w- with the stage it is right. It is right now. But 50 bucks. you're the t- person who buys a new iPhone every year, <laughs> and now you're having qualms of buying this technology. Is it just because it's not on a, on an Apple platform yet? No, because, oh, yeah. I, because I think if that, Apple had a VR yeah. headset, yeah, like, I'm sorry, you'd be on it. I think Google's a great platform for many people. Google's a platform now, eh? not for me. The Google and it is it is the Chromecast, the Home, the VR. You it know. is they, yeah. they do aspire to be a platform that is not. They're getting accurate. It's like the little engine that could. Oh wow! <laughs> <laughs> Likening one of the hugest tech behemoths in the world to the little engine that could. It's dry. It's just so it's going up that hill. <laughs> that note, uh, we should probably wrap up. I hope you brought great shoutouts this week. Oh. So starting with the one who, the little, little engine that could, Mr. <laughs> Zach Gilbert. Who are you shouting uh, out to? Children's books from the Starbucks. 90s. Yeah, I'm drinking a uh, Grande Chestnut Praline Latte. If you'd like to come back to your shout out, I do have one. Please uh, go ahead. Okay. okay. So my shout out is to the Pixel. So we have a little bone to pick with you, me and Patrick O'Rourke. Um, we've been having these connectivity issues, which mm. have actually sort of become a bigger thing and in getting into the news uh, this past week where our, uh, our LTE band four is dropping uh, when it's, on band four or like when it's trying to connect to band four and this is happening to me just constantly it's happening to me a little less but it's pretty frustrating it's pretty frustrating uh apparently there may be an update coming out to fix it we haven't received it yet so until then my beautiful google assistant half the time is like hey you don't have any internet we can't help you we don't even know if that uh the update that one of the readers reached out to us about is like a Canadian one, right? Like it could right. be coming through That's carrier right. side. You're absolutely right. So before hey, Zach, yeah, before you say that, the iPhone had a similar issue come when it came out, the 7 That's specific. What she said that's what she figured. <laughs> <laughs> Patrick, <laughs> the the hissing, the, oh, the well, not even the, the hissing. hissing thing. No, Ian was complaining about there was an update that was for carriers. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah I do so remember yeah. that now. What what issue? Because I was not. Like There's a c- carrier con- connectivity. Yeah, there was a carrier. Um, it was dropping calls, but it wasn't. Again. It wasn't as widespread. We also don't know how widespread this pixel thing is. Either, we don't. Right? We, but we do know that there have been complaints about it, not just from Canada, um, but around the world. Well, um, and both you are having issues, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So uh, yeah. mine less frequent. Yes, but and, I'm still and, having them. and some people are saying even on our carriers. So uh, Pat is with Telus. I'm with Bell. Um, some people are saying no, I don't have this issue at all. So it'll be interesting to see how that actually plays out. I really hope, but um, there's an update that, that so will help. As out. with anything in tech, if one person's not having a problem, then no one's having a problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right? So <laughs> exactly. M- my shout out uh, goes to Battlefield 1 for making me enjoy a first person shooter again. For those that don't know, Patrick <laughs> hates video games after <laughs> spending yeah. a lifetime covering them. Yeah, I spent, I spent uh, like a good over half a decade writing but mostly just games um so now i find it very difficult to find a game that excites me that's not virtual reality 
and Battlefield sort of, uh, I guess, piqued my interest because uh, it's a game that's set in World War One, which I think is, as someone who's interested in history, it's a, a horrible conflict that has never been explored in an interactive medium in that in that form. And I think uh, I think Dice made it. Is it Dice? Yeah, Dice. <laughs> That's so cool. Uh, EA's studio Dice made it, um, and I think they did a great job, and I think they handled a rather difficult subject matter in a very intelligent way. It's a very good game. Uh, on that note, uh, we are recording on November 11th, so please take a time. Uh, by the time you've heard this, uh, past, obviously, but yep. please take a moment to remember our veterans. Uh, Zach, your shout-out? Uh, so my shout-out after much deliberation within my head. Um and if you've been watching on the video, you know, your so no, so and you guys are gonna be like, ah, oh, full show. Um, Tim Cook. So, being somebody who talking about Tim Cook, who is very opposed to Donald Trump's views um, in many many subjects, and obviously we know Tim Cook is uh, he's gay, part of the LGBT plus Q um, community. So, and Donald Trump going on record and hiring the I don't know his name. The guy that works with him that's like, anyways. Pence? That's the guy, yeah. Right. Um, who has some questionable thoughts on that. Um, Tim Cook taking the higher road, you know, yeah. and, and stepping, in, stepping in and saying, you know what, we obviously know his views, but everyone's just allowed to have their own views and kind of let's go forward with this. Absolutely. That's a good shout out. Uh, my shout out goes to Leonard Cohen. Thank you for all your amazing music and rest in peace. Yes. Hashtag I'm still with her. No. Thank you for listening, guys. Uh, Zach, you had a just wanted where you can find us. Yeah, so uh, you can find us on various social networks. I'll start with uh, how you can find Mobile Syrup, and then we'll kind of work around quickly and see where you can find everyone else. So Mobile Syrup, you can find us on Twitter at Mobile Syrup. You can find us on Instagram at Mobile Syrup as well. You can find us on Snapchat, Mobile Syrup. Um, pretty much just search Mobile Syrup, and you'll find it. Facebook, uh, facebook.com forward slash Mobile Syrup. Um, and I'm pretty sure you can. F we're on Flipboard and all those. How dare much. you forget Google Plus? We're on Google Plus, the most important social media we are. platform. Yeah. Can you watch it in Daydream? That is the question. Oh, I wonder tonight. If you can. All of the likes you won't get on your <laughs> post. Um, in and uh, Igor, where can they find you in the go round? And well, where would you they can figure like out how to spell my last name, which is spelled B O N I F A C I C? I'm at Igor Bonifacic. Uh, I'm at Rose Bahar, spelled the same way that Joy Bahar spells her last name, B-E-H-A-R. That's on Twitter, right? Both of you? Yeah. Yes. You can find me uh, on Twitter at, at Patrick underscore O'Rourke, and my last name is O-R-O-U-R-K-E. I didn't take out my phone to check the spelling of my last name, but I, I couldn't remember if there's an underscore in my Twitter mm -hmm. handle or not, so I, I had to I'd actually that. prefer if you follow me on Elo. Elo, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That'd be a good one. Um, and you can find me on Twitter, and mine's super, super simple and easy at Zach with an H Gilbert. Beautiful. Boom. And Thanks for listening, it. guys. Have it, uh, or take it easy. Bye. Bye. Goodbye. <laughs>